Ladies and gentlemen, independent Americans around the country and around the world, we have a very special treat, a, a man that I am a huge fan of, a leader that I think is critical to this moment, also a master of this, uh, this podcasting and, and media medium, um, and a guy that I can't think of anyone who would be more important to talk to right now as we will get into uh, a new friend and, and a leader that we all need to hear from the great and powerful Professor Scott Galloway is here on Independent Americans. Welcome, sir. Uh, Paul, thanks for setting that impossibly high bar. <laughs> it's good to be with you. Well, you deserve it, man. I think, I think you know, I, I, we had a phone call last week and are just getting to know each other. Um, but I, I really have been grateful and impressed by your work, especially in this moment of chaos. Uh, it's, it's a wild time, man. Uh, thanks for saying that. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it always feels, it, no one ever wakes up and thinks, wow, this is, this feels like a boring era, but this does feel especially tumultuous or important. Well, I want to ask you the question I ask of, of everyone to start. Mm -hmm. uh, where are you in the world and how are you? Uh, I am in London. I moved here about almost a month ago. Um, I've wanted, my parents are from here. I've always wanted to live here. My I have school-age children, 12 and 15-year-old boys, and wanted to get them sort of out of their comfort zone and uh, do something different. I've been kind of molesting the earth for the better part of 30 years. And one observation I made is that America is still the best place to make money, but Europe is the best place to spend it. And I'm older than you. I want to slow down a bit and, you know, kind of stop and smell the roses. So I wanted to spend time in Europe. So I'm here. Uh, how am I? I'm, I'm doing, you know, I'm blessed. I'm doing well. Uh, it's been a bit of an adjustment. You know, my youngest is homesick. I don't, little things. I don't have my gym. I can't figure out how to charge anything. I can't figure, you know, I can't, I tried to watch Game of Thrones last night and couldn't figure out the TV. So it's, it's taking a little bit of adjusting, but that's um, all part and parcel. But so on the whole, you know, my worst days are better than a lot of people's best days. I'm doing, I'm doing good to great. Excellent. Well, I, I want to talk to you uh, about raising boys and parenting. We talk about mm -hmm. that a lot in the show, and I've got two boys that are about 10 years younger than you. I want to talk about the economy. I'd like mm -hmm. to talk about Elon Musk. I'd like to get your views on the political landscape, um, but maybe kick, to kick it off here, um, I, you know, you're, you're kind of a clarion voice and, and uh, an accurate predictor. We've had Malcolm Nance on here. We call him uh, Nostradamus. You know, I try mm -hmm. to be the Tony Romo of national security and politics, but you've been very effective in predicting what is to come. Jamie Dimon has now said that we're headed for a recession in, in six months or so. Uh, wanted to get your quick reactions to, to that, which seems to be reverberating, uh, and just the general uh, economic landscape that we're facing now and we're facing ahead. What, what do you see now and what do you see coming? Well, they always say that academics have predicted eight of the last three recessions, but like, I don't, I don't see how you can raise interest rates at the rate we've been raising them and not go into recession, or it's never happened before. And this is all a random walk. There's a first time for everything, but it's hard to imagine we're not going to have some flavor of recession when we're taking interest rates up as aggressively as, as we are. The purchasing power of someone who makes or has $2,500 to devote to a mortgage two years ago was a $760,000 home. Now it's a $460,000 home. The average mortgage, if you're in the UK, they're very fond of short-term variable mortgages. If you got a mortgage a year and a half or two years ago in the UK, you're about to see as a resets in the next six months, several million mortgages are about to go up 73% here. Energy, uh, energy price escalation, you know, supply chain. It's just hard to imagine we're not going to see some sort of an economic slowdown. At the same time, we're almost at full employment. So there's some contraindicators. But yeah, I think we're going into recession. And also, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. Um, I've been through the you know terrible thing about recessions is they always happen. The good thing about recessions is they always end. And recessions are generally speaking, they're more positive for guys your age in the sense that that decline in asset prices, you're kind of coming into your prime income earning years. I'm leaving them. So guys my age don't want volatility. We want to hold on to our wealth and we want to elect leaders that will pump Elvis full of so many steroids. And when I say Elvis, I mean the government, uh, I'm sorry, the economy, you, you know, pills to wake it up, pills to go to sleep. There's certain plants, pyrolytic plants that only germinate when there's a fire. 
the reason I'm economically secure and I get to move to London is because in 2008, 2009, they let the economy outside of the banking industry pretty much crash. And I got to buy Apple and Amazon for, you know, kind of literally pennies on the dollar. And what's dangerous about the current mentality in the US is we see recession or a decline in the stock market is this profound tragedy. And it's hard, it's difficult to go through. And from that rubble emerges opportunities for young people. When a restaurant goes out of business, when Brooklyn real estate gets cut in half, when Amazon and Apple and other stocks go down, as a younger generation comes into their income earning years, they get an opportunity to buy stuff uh, for you know on sale. And I, I don't, I don't, I think it's dangerous this mentality that we have to keep the existing rich rich at all costs. So I think, I think a recession is probably uh, coming, and I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. The economy is cyclical. Stocks can't rip up unless occasionally they rip down. We can't have the fuel. The wind in our sails of interest rates going down unless they go up at some point. So yeah, I, I say, you know, hopefully it's a recession, not a depression, but I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. You've got a good no shit way of breaking it down and making it real for, for people um, beyond the headlines. We talk a lot about leadership in this show, mm -hmm. and I ask you to kind of overlay that on the political and national security dynamics where you've got mm -hmm. leaders that are going to stoke political fires on different sides based off the fear of recession, the impact of recession, the personal feel of recession. Can I ask you if you're advising the president, right? If you talk to Biden and say, hey, man, this is what's coming. Here's what you should do. How would you how would you package that? And how do you see it impacting what is a pretty chaotic, dangerous political landscape where it looks like I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts, but it looks like we have a Biden Trump matchup coming with potentially third party candidates emerging. How do you see those two um, weather patterns colliding and, and coexisting in the next six to 12 months? So I didn't support Biden for president. I mean, I, would, I voted for him over Trump, but I, I didn't. I thought he was too old to be president and I wasn't a fan of President Biden's. And I think that there's a decent chance he's going to go down as one of the more important presidents and not for um, reasons that I think people think right now, but and you're going to forget more about this than I'm ever going to know. I'll talk about what I think is going on and what I would advise them to do. I think that the pushback and the victories in Ukraine are nothing short of a seminal moment in history. And that is someone who was a, a very powerful leader, a very politically astute, and has you know 12 or whatever it is, 20,000 nuclear warheads, is kind of muscling around Europe for a long time and blessed with blessed with huge reserves of oil. And right now, other than having actual boots on the ground, I would argue that, that the European Union and NATO are engaged in a conflict with Russia. And to be blunt, we're kicking their ass. And I think that we've put him in a corner and there's a lot of calls for, well, and I understand legitimate calls for, we need to deescalate, give him a golden bridge out, there's always a threat of nuclear war, but I, I believe that if this continues, if we continue to see the Ukrainians reclaim in one month more land than the Russians garnered in the previous five, I think this is a recalibration of the geopolitical dynamic to the West's favor. I think for the first time, we have an external threat that has made Europe a union. I think that we're going to find out after the fact, and I'd love to hear your view on this, that we played a bigger role than is getting pressed for in terms of intelligence and armaments um, and resources, just as we sent frigates and armaments and P-51s to Europe and uh, specifically to Britain in the late 30s and the 1940, I think we're doing the same thing, uh, importing gas to Europe such that they can get through the winter without being too reliant on Russian gas. I think this is a huge moment in history where we're turning back one of the most powerful autocrats. I think this will mean more people will live under democracy than autocracy. And I think it's a wonderful moment for America. And I don't think the Biden administration is getting nearly the credit it deserves. Uh, unfortunately, the presidency, the election will likely be determined by one thing, and that's the economy. And then if you go to the central component, it will give people the impression of how the economy is doing its inflation. And I would um, argue that inflation in the U.S. is probably the same or better than it is in any other Western country right now. The inflation here in the U.K. is worse. So 
I would probably be very focused on how do I bring inflation down? And I think they're doing the right thing. I think raising interest rates, cooling the economy, making investments in production and supply. Uh, I think we're going to see inflation come down more dramatically than people estimate. I think OPEC's decision to limit production is a giant fuck you to the West, to be blunt, um, at the hands of, uh, the, uh, of Russia and Saudi Arabia. Uh, but I think the Biden administration's only flaw, I, I think they put on a masterclass around Ukraine. I think their only real flaw is that they don't communicate it, mm. uh, uh, you know, the victory there and the critical role the West and NATO and EU and Americans are playing and taking more victory laps and also highlighting that one in three dollars in our, in our economy were printed during, during the Trump administration as he bailed out everyone and everything and spent 27% of the economy on bailouts where they just overdid it. Uh, and part of that is a relief package from Biden. But to believe that inflation is a function of Biden is just ridiculous. And so uh, I would put our shoulders back and be more proud of what we've been able to accomplish uh, in the West um, around Ukraine and pushing back on a dangerous autocrat. And also, um, uh, he has to get, he has to show some progress against inflation. Cause at the end of the day, for example, Latino voters on the left, we just, we just overestimate how liberal people of color are and uh, Latino voters will play a huge role in the election. Cause they tend to be moderates actually politically or, or, uh, ideologically, and they're very focused on the economy and the way they register how the economy is doing is inflation. So it's probably going to come down to inflation, which is a little bit unfair. But my advice to them would be uh, be much more vocal uh, about celebrating um, what I think is a, is, is, is a remarkable achievements to date around what's taking place in, uh, in Eastern Europe. Thank you for that. I think, I think it's, a, it's a thoughtful and, and comprehensive and, and at the same time, again, no shit assessment of what's happening and where we are. But I want to pull out a piece of that, that you have a mm -hmm. unique mastery. You understand branding and marketing and positioning maybe better than anybody. Uh, I agree with you on, on most of that. And, and Biden has been incredibly successful in the way he's handled Ukraine, the way he's led strongly, I think, and this can be a pivotal moment. How do they communicate that? Because you cut to the core of it, but there's always a question of, can they communicate that? He's an old guy. He's, he's not cracking through. Trump's going to disrupt him. There are going to be other disruptive forces. How do you think they thread that needle and communicate with American voters? And in particular, maybe as a, as a, as a follow on side question here, you're great at talking about how uh, white men, especially, uh, are thinking and, and reacting. That seems like it'll be a critical tipping point, not just for Biden in this election and Trump, but also going forward. So how do you think they can and should communicate those messages and those outcomes and that vision to that, that, to that demographic and others? Because it doesn't seem like they are, right? Like they have, they have good, good, good runs and they don't have strong surrogates. It seems like he's struggling all the time to get traction on his own victories. How do you think they, they do that and can they? Well, if I were to give them some credit, it would be that uh, the Biden administration realizes the distinctive uh, chest something right now and saying, you know, you know, dear Vlad, uh, you know, we're kicking your ass and creating perhaps more hostility and um, rhetoric that is not productive. I think that they are acting like grownups and always trying to leave an exit or trying to leave the opportunity for, for a resolution around the conflict. I think once and hopefully the conflict does come to some sort of resolution, if I were the Biden administration, I would leak all sorts of material around what a critical role we played in this. Because more women have been graduating from colleges in the last 40 years than men, and yet only 28% of our elected leaders are women. We, both men and women, are naturally sexist when it comes to choosing our leaders. We conflate leadership with broad shoulders and height and the tenor of your voice. So show me a five foot two woman who's got 130 IQ and is hardworking and great at what she does. She's president of the school board. Show me a guy with 110 IQ, six foot two and a full head of hair. And you know, his name is Senator. So mm -hmm. we, we really macho is sort of never out of style. People hate government unless you're carrying, you know, uh, uh, an assault rifle or you're, you're in a uniform, you know, it's, it's, we, the people we respect most is our armed services. That still is an organization that has huge respect. But 
you know, God help you if you're an IRS agent or on the school board somewhere. We've just decided that, you know, to be respected in government, you have to be in the business of delivering violence overseas. And by the way, I'm, I, I think it's wonderful that we have that kind of respect for our armed services. So I would go to the macho, if you will. And that is mm-hmm. if and when, hopefully in the next three, six, 12 months, this resolves, I would start planting stories. And this sounds Machiavellian or whatever. I, I would start planting stories about just how much time the Biden administration was working with NATO and uh, providing intelligence, armaments, and how just bottom line is quietly in an unassuming way, we just decided to kick them in the fucking nuts over and over and over. <laughs> and and I, I think that that would, if that, I would go for the chest beating strategy after we've kind of swung on the vines. I would do, I would wait until the conflict is over. And then I would uh, absolutely um, highlight the role we played here. Cause I do think, and I'm curious to get your view. I think we're playing a much bigger role than people recognize. I think the Ukrainian uh, 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 resource and military are nothing short of heroic. I think slowly but surely we're going to find out that a lot of NATO-led, EU-led, and American-led intelligence played a huge role here. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, we've covered it on this show at, at length, and I think the underestimated part of the battlefield, this modern battlefield, is the intelligence component. And and we're not going to broadcast it from, from the rooftops, hopefully, but the intelligence assets that we're providing in, in coordination with the technology, drones, uh, high Mars, we've talked about a lot in this show, they can be the tipping point while at the same time affording us this very unique luxury of not putting boots on the ground and not having American casualties, which is, in my view, what modern warfare could have looked like for America 20 years ago if we had approached Afghanistan and Iraq differently. So this, I think, in many ways is what the future of modern warfare looks like for America. Um, the, the question is, can we sustain that? Can we communicate that? And You've got a guy on the other side in Putin who, who doesn't abide by any rules or, or, or any restrictions. So he's a wild card and, and can you know set off a test nuke at any point. And then it comes back to Biden again. So I mm-hmm. I continue to think that the biggest variable in this entire political equation is the health of Biden and Trump, because the scenario nobody's planning for is if one of them dies and they're both 100 percent. They're both old. They're both you know increasingly having health issues. And if either one of them goes down, we're going to have a vacuum. And, and, and a disruption on both sides, right, from the political standpoint. So I think that tumult and that unease and that constant state of chaos is what we're facing. And people, I think you're right, they're going to look to the strong types. They're going to look to a Fetterman or a DeSantis or someone that's going to bang on their chest. I don't think it should be that way, but I think that's the reality of the branding environment they're operating in, which, which maybe takes me to another point I really want to get your thoughts on. Your book, Adrift, I think is 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 really catching hold because you're laying out this landscape, but also, you know, presenting a, an optimistic end state that is possible. What we talk about a lot in the show is independent Americans, the people who are not necessarily moderate, but are unaffiliated and say none of the above. The people who say, mm-hmm. fuck you to both parties. I don't mm-hmm. want any part of this system. But at the same time, they have a unique branding challenge. You know, mm-hmm. it's been defined by. Ross Perot, Steve Forbes, now Andrew Yang wants to be king of the independents. Can mm-hmm. you talk about from your scientific standpoint and, and the branding standpoint, what do you see as the opportunity for all of the independent Americans, the none of the above folks who are rejecting the duopoly? What's the opportunity from them from, for them from a structural standpoint? And mm-hmm. what's the opportunity from a branding and leadership standpoint? It's a tough one because generally speaking, third parties don't work. I mean, every once in a while we get jonesed up and talk ourselves into believing it's time for a third party and they just don't work. All that usually ends up happening is they end up being spoilers. Uh, Ross Perot gave the election to um, Clinton. Uh, um, Nader gave the election to Bush. They end up just being spoilers. And uh, now my understanding is the largest political party is none of the above or independent. I think it's 41% because people are just so turned off between gerrymandering people. It must be awesome to be a Senator or a representative because they will do anything to stay in office, including creating the most perverse congressional redlining. They'd like, okay, pivot. You know, I mean, have you seen these maps? They're just ridiculous. And they all basically say, okay, you draw some crazy map. That's all red. And I'll figure out a way to create some circuitous circuitous map. That's all blue. 
So it ends up that the basically the general election is, except for the president, is usually unimportant, uh, or it's it's not as important as it should be. It's usually who wins, and at least in the House of Representatives, who wins the primary, and who comes out for primaries, hard left or hard right, and we just have too many people uh, who don't. We have minority rule. We have people who don't. You know, we have thirty senators represent who represent about five percent of the population, and our uh, we have, um, you know, AOC and Ted Cruz are just never going to see eye to eye. They're just not going to, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to find common ground. And the majority of Americans on most issues do acknowledge less so because of social media and polarization that says to everybody, all right, we need to take you hard left or hard right, and then serve you media to satisfy that extremist position. But I do think that I, I'd like to think that uh, there's an opportunity, although I'm not seeing it. I see a need for moderates. I'm not seeing anything. Uh, the, the most hopeful thing we could have would be ranked choice voting. Uh, Lisa Murkowski, you know, would not have any chance without ranked choice voting. Um, we have to figure out a way to have more moderates. That rep- we have to have a more representative government because reality is, the majority of us aren't extremely left or extremely right. So I've made the argument, Scott, that the the solution to the two-party duopoly is not a third party. And what we're we're failing to do here is kind of think creatively about the broader opportunity and the solutions that have to respond. So it can't just be one party that is the solution. It needs to be a comprehensive strategy that includes candidates, public financing, ranked choice voting, all these other components on that spectrum. But there still seems to be a lack of a unified strategy and a lack of leadership. So what maybe asking you to put on your, your business and media marketing hat here, the question mm-hmm. is 41% of viewers, do they exist? Right. And I don't think they're just moderate. I think they're mm-hmm. more like the Howard Stern audiences and the Rush Limbaugh audiences of past are fuck you to the man and mm-hmm. fuck you to all the senators, but mm-hmm. nobody's really squared that circle. And that's why I say, look, the, the, the spirit animal of independence is not Andrew Yang. And, and it's more like George Washington, or maybe it's the rock. Maybe it's somebody that's a transcendent figure that is bigger than party and bigger than all this. Mm-hmm. So do you see a real, like a business opportunity here, right? From a political standpoint, is that 41% gettable? If you're Netflix or someone else and you're trying to access that audience, is it gettable? And and is there a way to get it without the rock? Um, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that, so the celebrity the celebrity sort of politician, I'm not sure that's the answer or waiting on an individual to show up. I think there needs to be structural change. So let me come out as an ageist. I think that we should have age limits uh, per your comments. I don't think people this old should be running for president. Um, And I get accused of being an ageist and I say, guilty. You know who's also ageist? Biology. (laughs) You know, who's also ages Germany that doesn't allow their Supreme Court justices to serve for longer than 12 years or past 65. You know who else is ages? The FAA, who says if you've got 400 people in the back, you can't be older than 65 because your physical and your cognitive abilities start declining. And there are now senators who need their staff to accompany them to the chamber because they don't know how to get there because they're so old. And uh, we are ageist when it comes to Senate. We decide that an 18-year-old who can give his or her life for their country, a 21-year-old who can drink alcohol, have multiple kids, they all need to wait 14 or 17 years before they can run for Senate. We are ageist on the bottom end. We need to be ageist on the top end. If you're going to be in your second term over the age of 80, you A, should not be allowed to run, or B, be subject to some sort of physical or cognitive test, because cognitive decline is real. And I, I, if Biden gets elected or Trump gets elected, these guys are going to be well into their 80s and we're going to be asking them to get on a plane at a moment's notice and go to Singapore and, and negotiate mm-hmm. a trade treaties. I mean, we took my dad's driver's license away at 78 and you're going to ask these guys to get on planes and negotiate. I mean, it's just it's just I think it's insane. Um, and I think we just need just as we age gate. At the lower level, we need to educate at the higher level. And also, I think that would have the benefit of the following. We need more churn. 50% of America is your age. They're 38 or younger. And 5% of our elected politicians are under the age of 38. A quarter of our elected officials are now older than 70. 
And when you have men this old, they're just out of touch. It's no accident that the ruler of Iran right now, the supreme ruler is 82, Khomeini. And you generally have, if you look at a society that really breaks down and ends up in revolution, it almost always involves a really old man mm. running the place who refuses to give up power. And there's so much advantage to the incumbents. And the, the system is so rigged, as I think a lot of our economy is, against young people and towards older people. Senator Dianne Feinstein shouldn't be in the Senate. Ruth Bader Ginsburg should have, been, uh, should have stepped down. We don't need a Clarence Thomas at the age of 100. Uh, in the, uh, on the Supreme Court. It's just, we need, to, we need age restrictions in, in the UK. You weren't allowed to serve as the CEO of a public company past the age of 65. And we need more youth. We need to clear out, we have a fixed number of senators and representatives. We need to clear out some people and give younger, elect, uh, younger people an opportunity to have representation. It's no accident that we end up with social security and bailouts that mostly benefit wealthy and older people when basically the presidential race is determined by the first couple states, Iowa and Maine, which happen to be some of the oldest and widest states in the nation. So I'd like to see age restrictions on uh, key offices, uh, which would create a lot more opportunity for representation amongst young people who have a different view of the world, who understand technology better, I think uh, see threats and opportunities in a different way. So what do we need? We don't need a third party. We need a Democratic and Republican party that better represent America and have a lot more youth. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see a, a structural change that stops the C Congress and the Senate between being a cross between the Golden Girls and the Walking Dead. This has just gotten out of control. Scott, would you? Would, I know I got to let you go in, in a couple of minutes here. Would you run? And and how do you? What? How do you categorize yourself politically right now? Are you an independent, unaffiliate? Where do you sit? And would you ever be a part of that disruption and and run for office or take office in 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 politics yourself? That's a generous question. Every time it's in the. Uh, I have some sort of economic gain that is public. I get a call from someone saying I should run because the primary criteria for running for office are that you're willing to put millions of dollars of your own money into the race because yeah. that's the reality now. Um, uh, uh, I'm a narcissist, so occasionally for a hot minute, I imagine myself running. I think I would enjoy running. I don't think I would enjoy doing the job. I don't very much. I don't enjoy people. And uh, I like running companies and saying what I want to say and the idea of trying to, I think the skill set that these individuals have to demonstrate in terms of their ability to get along with others and, and craft legislation, if they're going to be effective representatives is remarkable. I don't underestimate how difficult it is. In addition, you know, Paul, I feel like if you have a good seat in the media and you and you can write well, and you, you're, you lead with data, you can get it wrong, but as long as your heart's in the right place and you're willing to admit you got it wrong, I think you can have more influence as an outsider. I don't um, think the skills are, I think I, I appreciate that, but I also don't think the skills are as different as they used to be. And you don't have to yeah. be as cordial and, and, and uh, you know, uh, respectful as you used to be. You can still throw bombs, you can sit behind a mic and you can be Ron DeSantis. I mean, it works pretty well for a lot of folks. And I don't think that skill set is as different maybe as it used to be 50 years ago when you had to go into the chambers and negotiate legislation. But let me ask you, you didn't answer my question that I wanted to get you on it. Are sure. you are you an independent or what, what jersey oh, no, do no, you I'm, wear? I'm I'm um, absolutely a diehard Democrat and uh, who alienates most Democrats because <laughs> Uh, look, if I if it was the 70s, I'd be a Republican. I'd be a Rockefeller Republican. Yeah. I, I find I read things that Goldwater said. I'm like, that seems infinitely reasonable to me now in today's context. Um, I find the Republican Party has gone so off the rails. Uh, and most of the Democrats who hold office now, I don't I don't agree with because I find they're so extreme. But I'm still very much around the core platforms of choice around investing in the middle class, I'm very much, uh, I have and always will be, I think, uh, a Democrat. Now, it's, it's, I think, fun to say you're an independent. I'm, I'm center left politically. It depends on the issue, but I've always canvassed for Democratic candidates. And uh, I was at the end of the day, I think Democrats are unrealistic and naive, but their heart's in the right place. I find the Republican Party, the current platform is just, is just kind of, for lack of a better term, it's just mean. So- so, but yeah, I, I, I'd love, I'd love to see more independence in Scott, in if you were, if you were going to evaluate the forward party as a startup, how's it doing? Mm -hmm. 
Well, Andrew, Andrew, I like Andrew. I would consider him a friend. He brings attention to the right issues. If I were Andrew, I and I when he called me and asked me about it, I said, look, I, I'm, I'll support anything you support because I think you're an innovative guy and a, kind of a natural leader. I would have just said, pick an issue, rank choice voting, and just go after that. But the idea of starting a third party, it's kind of like, come on, boss. It just, it, and that's not to say there isn't a first or everything, but if you look around the world, it's mostly, again, these third parties just end up being spoilers. Um, so I, 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 think, I think Andrew's a natural born leader. If my advice to him would be the specific crowds at the general, I would just focus on ranked choice voting. You don't need to do it under the auspices of a, of a new party called forward. I think there's room for that kind of thinking in both parties. I think it's good advice. He won't come on my show till the end of November, so I'm hoping I can ask him when he does. Um, that surprises yeah. me. Andrew's pretty easy. Andrew likes to get his voice out there. It's surprising a lot of us right now, Scott, but let me w get your thoughts on, on another surprising yeah. thing that we've got to get you to talk about. Elon yeah. Musk. Elon yep. Musk is going to jump in, it looks like, on Twitter. What is the impact of that? And, and what do you think we should be looking for, asking for, demanding? I mean, this, this might be one of the most disruptive political moves that we see, especially if he lets Trump right back on. How do, how do you yeah. see that unfolding and what happens next there? Uh, look, a, a remarkable person. We're fortunate to have him. We're going to get to Mars sooner because of him, even if it doesn't happen in his lifetime. I think the EV race he inspired is probably one of the most positive things that's come out of the private sector. I also believe he should be held accountable when he does and says stupid things that are bad for society. So um, just as, you know, I like to think that I, I'm critical of Biden, who I admire when he doesn't uh, 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 quit himself well. In terms of Twitter, I think we probably overestimate Twitter in the sense that it's not a national treasure. And I don't, I don't like the idea of arbiting who gets to own things and who doesn't. And it's a private company. If he wants to put Yi or Donald Trump back on the platform, that's his right. It's a private company. All of this blather around free speech that he talks about makes no sense. This isn't the public square. It's a private company. You can kick off. You can, when he owns it, if he wants to put on David Duke, he can do that. And then he has to figure out, you know, there's a, there's a platform that is totally unbridled, totally anything goes, it's called 4chan. And it gets about, it gets a fraction of the audience of Twitter because people go on it and think this shit's just crazy and vile. I'm out. I think these platforms or Twitter, or to a certain extent, its success isn't despite quote unquote censorship, it's because of moderation. People just don't want to engage or be subject to some of that shit. So if he takes it over, he's a, he, the guy is creatively a genius. I, I've know a lot of billionaires. I think success is correlated with intelligence. I find if you had a room full of millionaires uh, or successful people and a room full of people of just uh, average average income level, you would be able to tell really quickly who are the millionaires. And that's, that's a common that people push back on, but generally speaking, uh, people who are successful are different. Now you take that same room and you create a third room and it's billionaires. I've known a lot of billionaires. I've never been able to discern a billionaire from a very successful person. I think a lot of that comes down to luck mm -hmm. and timing. If, if Musk hadn't gotten that loan, he was like 11 days away from bankruptcy and we'd be talking about him the way we're talking about Fisker. Remember them? They were, mm. they were neck and neck mm. with Tesla. So uh, the thing I, I don't like about Musk in terms of his role model to a young man, I don't think he is as appreciative of the society that has been responsible for him becoming the wealthiest person in the world. And that is America. There's a reason he mm. didn't start an EV company in South Africa. There's a reason he's not shooting rockets out of Montreal if you go up and down the California coast, you see these organizations that are uh, as valuable as the GDP of small nations. You start up north at Microsoft and Amazon. You come down to Meta, Google, Salesforce, Snap, Qualcomm, and San they're just litter the Pacific coast. But something happens right above Seattle. It stops mm -hmm. until you get to Vancouver and Lululemon. Something happens when you get south of Qualcomm and La Jolla. It stops until you go 4,000 miles to Mercado Libre in Argentina. So the reality is there's something about America, our rule of law, the massive investments we've made in these technologies, whether it's GPS or the loans we've made to EV companies or the infrastructure bill for charging stations or the space dividend. And I find that the most, the most patriotic group of people in America are 
you know, are, are you, Paul, and your colleagues, and people who served in uniform, who've invested the most in the nation are the most patriotic. And that's wonderful. And anyone who has kids realizes that when you invest massively in something, you just can't help but love it because you've invested so much in it. Mm. Well, that's really heartening. That's really wonderful. What's really discouraging is the people that are the most fortunate, I would argue, our tech billionaires tend to be the least patriotic. Mm -hmm. They're the first ones to start shitposting our elected representatives and government. And the general narrative out of tech, including Musk, is government should just get out of the way. And they mm. disparage them. Should we have gotten out of the way when we lent the government lent him $450 million to start his company? Should we get out of the way now and not provide $6,500 in tax credits or, or charging stations that are going to cost tens of billions of dollars? The middle class has made these extraordinary investments with the guidance of the most successful venture capital firm in history, and that's the US government, such that we could create these multi-trillion dollar companies sometimes that are a thin layer of innovation on top of middle class investments. So in some uh, genius, he's great. You know, Elon, stop shit posting America. I think that is a perfect point to end on because I asked you to get to parenting. You got to that. I, I hope you can come back and maybe we can talk just about tech and patriotism because I think there is something very, very important and interesting to explore there. My experience, especially going out there advocating for veterans was hitting a wall for many, many years until they realized the size of the defense budget and realized that there was a new wave of potentially uh, lucrative defense contracts that could come from Silicon Valley. And that was the breakthrough on some levels. But I think there's been a lack of, of patriotism. And it can be an evolution of patriotism. But I think you're hitting on something really, really important, especially if we talk about epic fights like like Ukraine and extremism here in the country and other things that I think are you know imminent threats to, to our national security. But You've been an, a, an incredible voice, Scott. I hope you can stick around for a couple quick fire questions for our Patreon members. They make this mm -hmm. possible. But um, you've been a voice of reason, man. And I hope Elon stays the fuck out of politics. And I hope you get in <laughs> in, in, whatever, in whatever way you can. Everybody check out his new book, Adrift. Follow him on Twitter and uh, check out the podcast and everything he does. Uh, Professor Scott Galloway, thanks for taking us to school, man. Appreciate you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for your good work. Stay vigilant, my friend.